My name is James O. Wilson. I am a 30-year civil servant with the United States federal government. I have been in the Detroit regional office for about 18 months. I have been a supervisory patent examiner for 16 years. And um, I've done a lot of different jobs at the USPTO. And it gives me a, a broad perspective on what goes on at the USPTO and how the PTO works. And today, in this role, my responsibility is to assist you and to provide you with some support and some information with regard to intellectual property. I'm hoping that this mic is going to allow me the opportunity to, to speak with it. Hit that button. Okay, are we good? Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, this talk is uh, an approved. What am I pointing at? To get it to, to work. Left and right. It's the left and right. There you go. Okay. Intellectual property basics. Uh, you know where you are. This is the Davenport Public Library, and it is one of the 26 PTRCs in the Midwest region. The Midwest region is comprised of the following states, Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, and Kentucky. It's a pretty big area. The Elijah J. McCoy United States Patent and Trademark Office is the first regional office. They were called satellite offices when we started, and then it was decided that when senior executives would come into these offices that they would be called regional offices. As a regional office, it is the first, it is approximately six years old or a little over six years old. It was opened in July of 2012. It is the only regional office that has a name or is named after a person and that is actually mandated by the America Invents Act of 2012 that brought our organizations, these regional offices, into existence. It is the first USPTO office located outside of Washington, D.C. It uh, has not only examiners, but it also has administrative patent judges on site. There are five United States Patent and Trademark offices. Of course, there is headquarters in Alexandria. There is the Detroit office in Michigan, the Dallas office in Texas, the Denver office in Colorado, and the San Jose office in Silicon Valley. These are some statistics about the United States Patent and Trademark Office for 2017. There are closer to 13,000 employees than there are, as you can see here. There are over 8,000 patent examiners, over 500 trademark examining attorneys, almost 400 patent trial and appeal board team members, and 71 trademark trial and appeal board team members. In 2017, there were almost 650,000 patent applications filed, and from those applicant, and let me rephrase, not from those, that's how many were filed that year, 350, approximately patents issued that year. They were not the ones necessarily that were filed in 2017. Some of these applications have been pending for one, two, or maybe even three years, but we were able to issue close to 650,000. No, I'm sorry, close to 350,000. 650 were filed and we have been lucky to see a steady increase in filings every year. Trademark applications, approximately 600,000 were filed in 2017, and roughly 243,000 certificates of registration were granted. IP and the Iowa economy. There are over 650,000 IP-related jobs. This statistic is from 2015. There are $2.9 billion of annual research and development that takes place in Iowa as it relates to intellectual property. Sales related to IP are $88.8 billion. 
And that's not just in Iowa, but that's generated by the Iowa businesses throughout the world. Higher wages for direct IP workers versus non-IP workers uh, are seen with 19%, almost a 20% increase in the amount of money that people make in the intellectual property industry. IP manufacturing exports uh, are 11.2 billion. They include uh, machinery that's it, from this state, as well as agricultural goods, corn, and the like. There's a higher value add per direct IP worker versus private sector workers. Yeah. Value add with regard to, um, I'm not exactly sure how we, we are assessing value add. I don't think that's not wages or salary. Not sure what that statistic means. All right, what is intellectual property? All right, intellectual property would be any creation of your mind. It is something like an invention or a poem or a logo that you would create. And uh, a person or a company may own some of all of these types of intellectual property, which include patents, trademarks, trade secrets, and copyrights. Quick review of what copyrights are. Copyrights protect original works of authorship. Uh, so that's any artistic, dramatic, literary, or artistic work that is fixed in a tangible medium. So that would include a sculpture. You can get a copyright for a sculpture, a song, a poem, um, a, a work of art such as a play, uh, a, screen, a screenplay for a movie, or those types of things. All of those would be things that you could get a copyright for. The Library of Congress administers registrations of copyrights. The USPTO advises the executive branch on intellectual property issues involving copyrights, but there is a copyright office. All right, the symbol circle C can be used without a registration for a copyright. So you don't have to have something registered as a copyright to use that symbol. If you have made a poem or you've written, a, you've written a poem or you've written a song, you can use that symbol to indicate that it is copywritten because it's an original work. Yes, ma'am? I had heard that um, because it doesn't have to be registered, if someone else creates something similar to yours and copyrights it, that uh, it is the first person who used it, who can prove I used this and started using this in 2005, who actually has the rights to use whatever that is. Okay, if you, <laughs> if, so you're saying that the second person copy, got right. the registered copyright. Well, I won't say it's an infringement because it's not registered. But if someone um, creates a song that is similar or almost identical to the first one, and the first one was copyrighted because that person created it in 2005 and maybe the second one created it in 2011, then the second one basically would be null and void. Our goal is to avoid there being any that type of confusion. That's, that's why we encourage everybody to register their copyrights. That's why we encourage people to register copyrights. The courts would decide okay. who would be the actual copyright, the person who would get the copyrights <coughs> rights, okay? Why register? Why should you register for a copyright? You should register so that you can show prima facie evidence of validity of your copyright, and, the, and you would get a certificate that would verify that you have this copyright. You can uh, receive statutory damages and attorney fees if someone does infringe upon you and you're able to prove that. Registration allows the owner of the copyright to record the registration with US Customs Services for protection against importation of infringing copies. So you come up with yours and you, you register it and someone somewhere else sees it and they like it, but they try to, they realize that you're selling it and they try to sell it in the United States. Customs 
Service, U.S. Customs Services, is responsible for identifying and assisting in the protection and the enforcement of your copyrights as a stakeholder. Prerequisite for bringing suit for infringement for works whose country of origin is the United States. If you want to have copyright protection in China, you have to file for copyright protection in China. There is no global copyright protection that is available to you. How long does a copyright last? It, the, life plus, the lifespan of the person who came up with the copyright or the person who has received the copyright plus 70 years. 95 years from publication for works made for hire. So if I have someone assist me or, or uh, I ask someone on my behalf to come up with a sculpture or to come up with a painting, then this is the different time frame or the time frame that that work would be protected. That's how long the copyright would last if it's a work for hire. Trademarks, what is a trademark? It's any word, symbol, device, or any combination there of use to identify the source of products and services. So everybody knows what the, what the biggies are. McDonald's, Burger King, Apple, Macy's, Michael Jordan, GM. These are recognizable symbols. And when you, you don't only recognize the symbol, but you also recognize the products that are associated with them and the quality that's associated with them. Examples of trademarks include um, a word, a slogan, a symbol, a design, or a combination of these, including product packaging, such as the Coke bottle, product design, uh, such as the Apple Store, and trade dress. A trademark can also be a sound, a color, or a smell. And uh, whenever I think of a sound, the first thing that comes to mind is Aflac. Mm -hmm. The duck, trademark. Okay, when I think of a color, I don't think of Tiffany, uh, Robin, Robin's Egg Blue, which is the color of Tiffany boxes. I don't think of that, but I know a lot of people who do. Um, and smell. Those shoes that you see there, the red on those shoes smells like bubble gum. Yeah. Design, you could look at it. Everybody knows what a Hershey's Kiss looks like. Federally registered trademark. Why would you federally register your trademark? You have the right to enforce your trademark nationally and bring legal action in federal court. Use of a federal trademark symbol is the R with the circle. A lot of times you'll see something that just simply has TM associated with it. You do not have to have your mark, your mark does not have to be federally registered in order for you to use TM, okay? You have the right to record marks with customs and it serves as a basis for foreign filing. If you have a registered trademark here, it can be the foundation and the basis for which you're going to file in another company. Publication in the U.S. trademark database allows anybody who is interested in trademarking something to find your trademark and say, oh, I think I probably can't get a trademark that looks this much like the Kellogg symbol or that looks as much like the Starbucks symbol. What makes trademark protection so special? Federally registered trademarks can last forever, as long as they are properly and continuously used. Maintenance documents must be timely filed. In contrast, patent protection and copyrights last for only a limited amount of time. Trade secrets. What is a trade secret? The formula for Coca-Cola. 
how the 11 herbs and spices are incorporated into uh, wings and thighs and breasts in order for you to enjoy the deliciousness of Kentucky Fried Chicken. And everybody's favorite, well, I can't speak for everybody, my favorite, Krispy Kreme Donuts. An overview of IP trade secrets. Any information that derives economic value, this is the definition of a trade secret, any information that derives economic value from not being generally known or ascertainable. It can be a formula, it can be patterns, it can be compilations, it can be a program, a device, methods, techniques, or processes. Protection stems from common law dating back to the 1800s. All states have some sort of trade secret protection. Most laws based on the Uniform Trade Secrets Act, and in 2016, the Defend Trade Secrets Act was signed by then President, who was the President of the Obama, okay. Why are trade secrets useful? They protect commercially valuable proprietary information, the formulas, the recipes, the things that are kept secret. And it allows for a company to have a competitive advantage whether it's a customer list, product formulations, search or algorithms, it's what makes a company special. There's no, I don't think it, there's anybody who knows how Google does what Google does, how it actually searches, how it, and then some of the formulas that they use and some of the algorithms that they use in order to allow for the actual search engine to operate the way that it does. Trade secrets are not generally known and must be subject to reasonable efforts to preserve their confidentiality. So there's no set term for protection. And so here are some of the ways that you can lose your trade secret protection. Failure to take adequate steps to prevent disclosure. Uh, please don't leave the formula for Coca-Cola sitting on my desk. Or the manner in which you're going to make Krispy Kreme donuts. Don't mail it to me. You know, take steps to protect the secrecy. Owner or owner authorized disclosure. You know, what is it? Uh, somebody beans. Duke is always trying to give away the Duke, the dog is always trying to give away the formula to uh, Bush's beans. Uh, yeah. Make sure that people who are associated with your company who have information on the secret that they are bound in some way, shape, or form not to disclose what the secret is. So protect yourself in that manner. Reverse engineering. If I figured out what the formula for Coca-Cola is or would be, then I could make that formulation and I could sell it. I couldn't call it Coca-Cola, but anybody whose palate is discriminating enough to say these are so close and so similar they might decide that they want to buy my slightly less expensive soda than Coca-Cola. Independent development. You might come up with something that has a secret on your own. And if you were to do that, then you know, you're not infringing on anybody or hurting anybody because you came up with it just as the other people came up with it. The person who holds the trade secret. Pat. What is the role of our patent system? It is to protect inventions, and I'll go into how we define inventions. It encourages innovation and inventions. It promotes commercialization and application of invention, because a patent application clearly articulates and set forth, sets forth how to make and how to use the invention. And then there is, it accelerates the commercialization of invention to all of society. That disclosure allows everybody to take a look at it. You'll be protected for a certain number of years, but everybody will be able to take a look at that disclosure and say, wow, there, are, there may be alternative and additional ways to improve upon this. Over 
overview of IP. What is a patent? It's a property right. It's the right to exclude others from making, using, selling, offering for sale, or importing a claimed invention. It does have a limited term, and there are various, there are, are different types of patents that have different terms. A patent application is filed and provides protection in a specific area or territorially. There is no world patent that would allow you the opportunity to be protected throughout the world. Government grants the property right in exchange for disclosure of the invention. So you're going to have to tell us how to make it, how to use this invention, and we will protect you for a, a specific amount of time depending on the type of application that it is. An overview of IP patents quid pro quo. Um, we have two examiners here, Thomas Jefferson and Albert Einstein. Einstein. Uh, we have inventors, Elijah J. McCoy, Henry Ford, and Michael Jackson. And uh, the examiner would, would look at what the inventor has, has created, and uh, they would disclose that to us, and the federal government would provide you with assistance in protecting it. Everybody is aware of what each one of these inventors invented, correct? Are you aware of what uh, Elijah J. McCoy invented? He invented a means back in the, in the 1800s for lubricating the axles on locomotives. And so a lot of people were trying to emulate what it was that he invented. And that is where the term, is this the real McCoy? comes from because no other person's knockoff was able to work as well or to do as efficiently what his invention was able to do. So when people needed this device, they would ask, is this the real McCoy? I think that's Henry Ford, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. yeah. Does anybody know him? Yeah, I'm driving a Ford today, so I'm sure. Uh, a lot of you probably are driving uh, vehicles and you're familiar that he is the inventor of, of the horseless carriage. And Michael Jackson. Have you any idea what Michael Jackson invented? A shoe. A shoe. And do you know what that shoe is famous for allowing a person to do? To, to tilt. The, the, the shoes that were used in the smooth criminal video where, and I always wondered how they did that. All of the people lean and bend over and they're almost everybody's at an angle like this. Michael Jackson invented a shoe that would fit into the floor, that would, that would fit into grooves in the floor and allow a person to lean and tilt their body that way in, in, in various angles. So yes, Michael Jackson is also an inventor. Why get a patent? What's the, what's the big deal? I mean, you. There are people who choose to get patents and there are people who say, no, I don't need a patent. Patents are used to gain entry into and deter others from a market. You can shut people down if you have a patent and you have disclosed how to make and use something, whether it's a process or an article of manufacture or a drug or whatever. You can, you can keep other people out of the market. It can be used as a marketing tool to promote unique aspects of a product uh, what do you hear them ask on Shark Tank all the time? Do you have a patent? And the reason why is because there's, there's value in having 20 years of exclusive use of a product. Okay? Assert, it allows you to insert enforcement rights against an infringer or a competitor. And it's used as collateral to obtain funding, like I said, in Shark Tank and it can create revenue. Uh, you can sell or license it just like property. You may come up with something that could be used in another process or could be used with something else and it's the best piece of, or it's the best type of a piece of, an, of something that's needed. You can license that to the people who need it and make your money that way. You don't ever have to use it. You can just let somebody else use it. Utility patents. Utility patents protect how an invention works, 
functions or is made. Utility patents are issued for processes, machines, articles of manufacture, or compositions of matter. Is there anybody who does not think that they know what each one of those means? Now, we say processes. processes. Processes may also include methods for treating. As a patent examiner, I always associated processes with mechanical things and with non-bio-affecting things. And when it involved the human body, I would call it a method for. It would be a method for, a, one is a method and I would call one a process, but they are one and the same. So if you see a patent that says a method for, it is a process. Everybody knows what a machine is, an article of manufacture, something that is made, or a composition of matter, which would be a drug or, or a dye or something that uh, is a chemical. There are also design patents, a design patent is merely the way something looks. I have to, I confess every time that I, uh, I give this talk that the second day that I was a patent examiner in the patent office, I ordered up the Air Jordan design patent so that I could say that I actually saw the patent application. Off of this desk, it sat about this high with, with singular sheets of paper in it. And it wasn't bound because we didn't have anything to, to bind it with. And I sat and I started going through and I was like, okay, I think I've seen it. I put it back together the way that it was and sent it back to where, where it had come from. Um, it is interesting to think that something as, as simple as we would think as a sneaker would have papers this deep, that deep. But most Designs don't, uh, don't require that degree of documentation and as expensive as and as popular as those items are, we could probably conceive in our minds that there's a lot that goes into them, their design and the litigation of those documents. I mean, in the litigation of those shoes. Plant pack. Granted for new asexually reproduced plants. The term 20 years from filing. And that's major in the state of Iowa with regard to the agriculture that goes on here in this state. So um, we, we do send our uh, plant examiners to Iowa and various other places so that they can go into actual businesses and see the actual impact and learn about new techniques and be exposed to what's going on in industry and the impact that they're having and that the research and development is having on what they need to know in order to make determinations of patentability. Wow, we're not doing that. Okay, that's, that's the process. This is somebody's idea that this is simplification of how you get a patent. And uh, I know it's probably really small on your, <laughs> on your handout. Uh -oh. One of the things that I think that I'll do in the future is bring a big sheet that just has that on it so that you can have that. And that's a lot of information. Provisional utility applications. Now, a provisional application is a concept that came about, um, they have not always existed. Uh, even in my 30 years as a patent examiner. Provisional applications, we, I like to refer to them as a placeholder. If you have an invention and you're not, you're not ready to move full steam ahead with it, and you're still trying to get some money or you're still trying to figure out some of the aspects of who the market might involve and, and the like, you may want to put a place, put, put a stake in the ground and say, I'm staking a claim. I'm not moving forward, but I'm staking a claim on this invention. 
And your provisional application has to contain enough information to support the next application, which is a non-provisional. That application is the, actually the application that the examiner is going to look at. So these provisional applications don't get examined. They don't get examined for patentability. Now we do go back and look at them to make sure that everything that you put in your provisional, in your non-provisional, has support in this provisional application. You're starting here with a general outline of what your invention is and, and what it's going to entail. And you're going to take your time to do your research and talk to uh, people who might provide funding and develop it for you or provide you some, some support. You have 12 months, 12 months from the filing of this provisional application to convert your application into a non-provisional so that it might be examined by an examiner and you could find your way on your way to getting a U.S. patent. And that is the road. Okay, you can file the non-provisional application and still not get a patent. An examiner may find that your invention is not novel or it's not non-obvious, that you really didn't invent something. You might have come up with an idea, but your in, in idea is not patent worthy and your application would go abandoned. If you don't do anything with this provisional application in 12 months, the provisional application will also go abandoned. Provisional utility applications these are some of the requirements. It's a simplified filing, so it doesn't involve everything that a non-provisional would include. You provide a specification or a clear description of what your invention is, and it needs to be in compliance with uh, 35 U.S.C. 112 paragraph A, meaning that it should be enabled, there should be a clear written description, and you should provide the best mode for using your invention. Okay. You can provide and include drawings if they're necessary. And you need to, of course, pay the filing fees to the government so that we will pick your provisional application up and we will set it aside and we will uh, allow you that 12 months to move forward and develop. The United States Patent and Trademark Office is fee funded. We don't receive any monies from the federal government Provisional application is automatically abandoned after 12 months, and it's not examined. You must file a non-provisional application before the one-year period ends. So, you file your provisional, you do your placeholder. We have uh, documents in the back that provide guidance with regard to provisionals, non-provisionals, trademarks, copyrights. We have all this type of information in the back. An inventor is given time to investigate market potential, as I've said, or make improvements. Changing too much, though, could result in you losing that date. That's why I said everything that you put in your non-provisional should find support in your provisional application. The term patent pending is allowed to be used um, once you filed a provisional application. It's a low cost way to establish an early priority date in a non-provisional patent application with fewer formalities and fewer responsibilities. Uh, claims are not even required in a provisional application. Now when we get to the non-provisional patent application, this is where it gets serious. It's always serious, but this is where it gets more serious. You have 20 years of patent protection from the filing date. It's examined for patentability by a patent examiner. At least one claim is required. And we say that the claims define the patent grant. And a claim always starts with I claim or we claim. If there are multiple inventors, it's we claim. If it's you, a singular person, you say I claim. And you would say it would be a number one. And a claim is a single complete sentence. And it can be a long sentence. I've seen a single claim that was three pages long. 
So there are a lot of commas and semicolons and all that type of stuff. They should be grammatical, but they should be clear. And they have to articulate specifically and directly what your invention is. You can request that your non-provisional application not be published 18 months after it's, it, it's filed, but if you don't request that your application not be published, it will be published, okay? We will publish that, and it will join the body of prior art in the area where your invention is classified. What does a non-provisional utility application include? It's governed by the Manual of Patent Examining Procedure, or what we call the MPEP. Uh, and what's included in a utility application are the individual headings that you see here. There's always a title, there's an abstract that's approximately 150 words long. There's a specification that's broken down into the background of the invention. What is the field that your, invent that your invention is found in? A brief summary of the invention, saying exactly what problem you're solving and how you're solving it. A brief description of the drawings, and then we go into a detailed description where you specifically set forth how to make and use your invention, okay? And then there are the claims. The claims are what define the patent grant. That's actually what's patented. The patent is based off of the claims. The specification provides a, def uh, a dictionary or a source of information to define all of the individual terms and things that you have in your claims. You can have drawings if they're necessary. Status. Um, When you're filing, there are different fees that are associated with what you have to pay for in order to have your application examined. And there is a status that's called small entity status. And, it, and small entity status can include a nonprofit organization, such as a university, a person such as an individual inventor, we refer to as pro se, or a small business concern meeting the standards set forth by the SBA. We actually have an SBA representative here with us today. And I'm going to be finished soon enough to give her an opportunity to say a couple of words to you about small entity status and what the requirements might be. Um, but included here uh, are some of the responsibilities, uh, some of the requirements which include you have a company that does not exceed 500 persons. If you're a single inventor, you're not worried about a company with 500 persons. Small entity status falls within one of these three categories and has not assigned license or otherwise conveyed an interest in the invention to a, a non-small entity. So you haven't, uh, you haven't come up with a mouth mouthwash and then uh, licensed it to Procter & Gamble, which would be a large entity. Micro-entity status is based on gross income basis. To qualify for micro-entity status, um, we, you would have to disclose what your income is, and the applicant must comply with the small entity requirements, application filing limit, gross income limit on applicants and inventors, and gross income limits on parties within an ownership interest of the inventor. Provisional versus non-provisional. A provisional application is not examined. A non-provisional application is. That is the application that would go before the examiner. There's a one limit, a one year time limit for a provisional application. Uh, for a non-provisional application, it is published 18 months after you file it, okay? You can only get a provisional application for a utility application. You cannot get a provisional application for a design patent, and you cannot get a, uh, a provisional application for a plant patent, okay? Only for utility invention. So that's the method, the, composi the process, the composition of matter, the article of manufacture, 
or the composition of matter. Those are the types of inventions that you can file for a provisional. A provisional is a low cost way to establish an early date and a non-provisional application is that form of the application that can develop into a patent. And you would generally have protection for 20 years. All of these are attributable to utility applications. Applicants have a duty to disclose everything that they know about their own invention. If you're familiar with some printed publication or some information that would be of interest and that might assist the U.S. government in making a determination on patentability, then you have a duty to disclose under 37 CFR 1.56. Obviousness. Is there anybody here who is interested in understanding and me going into what obviousness is with regard to an invention? You can look at the top, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this so fast it's going to make you dizzy. You can look at the top two and see that they are identical. Okay? So there is no distinguishing characteristic between the two green cars. But if you look at the two modes of transportation, I, would, I don't even know that I would call a kind of Stogo wagon a mode of transportation in this day and age. But if you look at these modes of transportation, you can see that they're not the same but they might be used to provide the same type of, uh, lo it, they could be used to provide locomotion, well, a way for you to move from point A to point B. So these would not be obvious. It's not, th these are not obvious variants of one another, but the two at the top are so obvious that they are identical. Now, John Deere is interesting because we're in Iowa. So the factors that we use in order to determine obviousness are based off of a piece of case law, which is Graham versus John Deere. John V. Is it John V? Mm -hmm. what's, the, what's the middle initial for? Mm -hmm. Is it John V? Okay. All right. In determining obviousness, you must consider the scope and the content of the prior art. Prior art is anything that is a year or more older than what your invention is that's in the same field of endeavor. That the examiner would look to to see whether or not what you have is so close to it or close enough to it that he could make an assertion that you haven't invented anything. It's disclosed right here. It's in this publication. So you can't get a patent for something that already exists. What are the differences between the prior art and the claims at issue? These are the things that would be of concern to you. You would argue, or your representative would argue, well, these are not the same. The examiner has used this piece of prior art and has pulled these references and brought them together to present and say, I haven't invented anything, or my client hasn't invented anything, but these are the differences, okay? What is the level of ordinary skill in their art at the time of the invention? Well, for some things it's the level of a PhD, and for some levels it would be um, much lower than a, a physician or a doctor or somebody. It would depend on the complexity of the invention and who would be considered one of ordinary skill in the art. Does any objective evidence of non-obviousness exist? Now, those would be secondary considerations, such as I could have a process for making something and doing something, and Cynthia? Cheryl. That's what I said. Cheryl <laughs> could ha also have a means for making something. Cheryl's means for making something could be half the, it could cost half as much as my process. That's significant. That's something to consider. Even if our processes are similar, if she can do it in, with half the amount of money, it might be patentable. Okay? Or if there's some long felt need that Cynthia's invention satisfies and it's very similar to mine, but mine does not satisfy that. That's another consideration. These are objective, this is objective evidence that what she has invented is not obvious over my invention or whatever is in the prior art. 
if there is some uh, edge or some advantage that your in invention provides, then you're good to go. We talk about Fosita. It is a hypothetical person of ordinary skill in the art. And, a, and in a lot of instances, patent examiners are more than individuals of ordinary skill in the art. Oftentimes, they are experts in the art. These are the secondary considerations that I was just talking about. An unexpected result, a long felt need or failures of others, commercial success, copying by others, others looking at what you've done and, and going after it and copying it or copying some aspect of it, inoperability of the art that, I, that an examiner might try to apply against you. You could say, well, the examiner has made a case, but the case doesn't stand because what they are, are, are arguing won't accomplish what my invention will. And there's skepticism of, it, of experts. And as I said, uh, skepticism of experts could include skepticism by an examiner. There are all types of resources that are available to you from the United States Patent and Trademark Office. You can come into the Elijah J. McCoy Midwest Regional Office or the Texas Regional Office or the Rocky Mountain Regional Office or the Silicon Valley Regional Office and actually speak to someone who could assist you with a search, who could provide you with uh, specific information that you might request or might need with regard to filing an application or the process or an issue that you might be having. IP regionally focused workshops, conferences, and roundtables allow as our China IP Roadshow in Iowa City did, individuals in the area to understand the significance and the importance of intellectual property and how it is significant and important in the specific area where you live. Of course, if you think about Detroit, you think about the auto industry, and you think about autonomous vehicles, and here you would think about agriculture, and you would think about farm, farm uh, equipment. And in Texas, I don't know what they would think about. In Texas, they think about oil. And in Silicon Valley, they would think about IT. They would, you would think about software and computers. So each one of the areas, there is some, uh, some interest in the actual manufacturing and economies of those regions. In our area, in each one of the offices, there is an opportunity for uh, us to host patent trial and appeal, appeal board proceedings. At one point in time, you had to go to Washington in order to do this. Now there is a regional patent office in each of the time zones in the United States. Each one of these offices exists in a separate time zone. We have interview rooms that are available to our stakeholders in our area. If you wanted to talk to an examiner or you wanted to interact with an examiner, you could come into our office and there is a room with a screen about this size that you could sit down and actually have a teleconference with an examiner. And, and, and you and uh, if you were an attorney or you and your attorney could come in to our office and actually have a one-on-one -on -one with a patent examiner. There are expert training capabilities for local experts to train our nationwide USPTO workforce. When I started at the USPTO and there were no regional offices, most of the people who worked at the PTO were from the East Coast. Because there were not a lot of people who were, who were willing to move from California to DC to take a patent examining job. Okay? So now, we have a growing nationwide workforce with the advent of our hoteling program that allows examiners to work full time from an alternative location other than in one of the offices. That means they're home. They have to designate specifically what that location is and there's some requirements that they have to fulfill. But we allow examiners to work from anywhere in the continental United States. And I know of an examiner who actually works in Hawaii, and I know of a, a patent trial and appeal judge who works in, I think he retired, but he worked in Hawaii also. And I believe that now you can hotel from Puerto Rico. So 
you know, we're, we're getting there. We're getting to the point where it doesn't matter where you are, the business of the patent office can be, you can do the work of a patent examiner or you can work for the patent, ex, uh, patent office wherever you are. We have a search room at the Elijah J. McCoy Midwest Regional Office where you can get assistance. If you did have an invention and you wanted to see whether or not someone else had invented the same thing, you could come in and we would help you and assist you in walking you through a search. The same thing is applicable right here at this Patent and Trademark Resource Center. Bill in the back could provide you with ex expert. Bill in the back could confident. provide you with confident <laughs> search strategies and support to help you determine whether or not you don't want to waste your time and you don't want to waste your money. So the very first step is to determine whether or not you really have invented anything. Have I really invented something? And the way you find that out is you go and do what the examiner is going to do. And you look for it. And if you don't find it, maybe you've got something. We have um, two workstations that are here. How many do you have here? One Pub West, Pub East station. Okay. So there is a station here. Do you have to uh, come in and request? Do you have to sign up for it? No. Nope. Uh, if you know how to use the fob, you're ready to roll. Okay. There you go. So if you have an invention and you want to search it, come on in. You must have a valid ID, photo ID, and if you drove here, you probably should. And access to the patent search resources, including Pub East and Pub West. Yeah. You're in a patent and trademark resource center right now. Uh, I've actually visited the Leslie L. S. Malpass Library this morning. So I drove out to Macomb on your uh, fabulous highways and byways and had an opportunity to discuss with the gentleman there and to look at their facility and to uh, encourage him. He is about to retire and uh, this university is uh, struggling financially as, some, as a lot of universities are. Funding's being cut, things aren't being uh, maintained and upgraded. And uh, as much support as we can give to our PTRCs, we want to be able to do that, which is part of the reason why I'm here supporting Bill. We have lawsuit school clinics throughout the country. There are patent and trademark schools, schools, the ones that you see in blue. There are patent programs for law school clinical certification. Uh, and there are trademark programs. So in these, in these programs, there is a faculty member who is responsible for assisting students in assisting local individuals with intellectual property needs. It's a great program and it's a great training ground for uh, young attorneys or, or uh, budding attorneys. It allows students in a participating law school clinic program to practice before the USPTO under the strict guidance of a faculty and clinical supervisor. The OEO director grants participating law schools limited recognition to practice before the USPTO. This was signed into law on December the 16th, 2014. Current expansion period, that's out of date. Currently there are, I believe that there are over 60 law schools actively participating in this program. So this slide needs to be updated. We have a, there is a patent pro bono program um, which provides assistance to those individuals who don't want to get an attorney and want to go it alone and want to seek getting intellectual property protection on their own. Okay, That website that's, that's up there uh, provides qualifications for participation in the program. These are where we have pro bono clinic areas. The closest one to you is Chicago Kent. Yes? Yes. I'm not sure. Oh, there's one in Kentucky, Ohio. Minneapolis. Yeah. Okay. So there are quite a few in the Midwest region. Quite a few of these hubs. The Chicago Kent 
patent hub, you have to actually file for an application in order to participate in their pro bono program. And if you are selected, they will assist you in pursuing your intellectual property endeavors. Legal Core Inventor Assistance Program. This is a Minnesota nonprofit. We're in Iowa. We're going to skip it. Pro Se Assistance Program. Um, I did just touch on that. The website and the link is here. There's information in the back that will allow you the opportunity to go to that website and find more information. Wow. Are there any questions? I blasted through that presentation. That legal court did have Iowa listed two slides back. One forward. One more forward? Yep. Does Iowa. First bullet point. The dash provides free legal rep to qualifying low income inventors in Iowa. It certainly does. Okay. Iowa and Wisconsin and Minnesota. I got to remember that. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Is there anyone who has any questions or anything they'd like to ask? Yes, ma'am. I have two questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, I started a trademark process about 10 years ago. There was one patent trademark attorney here in town who charged $300 an hour. So I did the whole process myself. Did you get your um, trademark? I've done four of them now. Congratulations. All went through successfully. The last one, the fifth one, didn't. Um, it got rejected. And when I got the letter, it was written in legalese. And I could not understand what the examiner wanted, so I emailed the examiner and I said, it was a description of the services. What do you need from me to clear this up? And all he did was reference some other publication which said the same thing as the rejection notice did. So I ended up contacting an attorney and saying, can you make sense out of this language? And this attorney knew exactly what PTO was looking for, mm. reworded it, submitted it, and I got it. Now, having said that, when I started down this road for this particular, this is the name of my company. Yes, ma'am. The application asks for your URL. So I went to put my URL in. And, well, what had happened without my knowledge is my marketing assistant did not retain the domain name. Oh, so the so domain name now had been taken by someone else. Mm. I contacted that person. I went through ICANN. I contacted the person and said, hey, I've had my company for 13 years. This was a mistake. Um, I'll buy the domain name from you. Um, how can we work this out? And they refused to do anything. Okay, so now the trademark has gone through. I own the trademark, which means that their domain name now is being used illegally. I don't know whether I know I've been told that if I send them a cease and desist letter, they will ignore it. If it comes from an attorney, then they will pay attention to it. I don't know how to resolve this. So I'm taking any suggestions. Okay. I can't give legal advice, um, but you sound like you articulated a solution to the problem that included the involvement of an attorney. Sounds like it. <laughs> if only there were a few of us in the room. If we are yeah. all attorneys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, I, and I want to applaud each and every one of you for not going to sleep because this is stuff that you know. You know over and over. And you know very well. Well, maybe um, we're going to be done here in a couple of minutes, and maybe one of them um, might have, be able to engage you in a conversation, or maybe you might be able to secure the resources of one of these one of these five attorneys. My second question. Yes, ma'am. I created and released a mobile app. When I did my research, it took me five years to create it. It was published in 2005 to iTunes. I couldn't figure out where in the heck that fit in terms of copy my trademark. Um, what what you might need to do in order to protect it. Okay. Um, I protect it. I trademark the name. Okay, so the name and the logo are protected. Okay. The content of the app itself and how it functions is not. And I don't know how to protect that because I can't tell what the Is it fixed under. in media? Me. Is, it, 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 is, it, is it text that's fixed, mm -hmm. that articulates what's, and then I would venture to say that you probably could get a copyright for that. Okay. 
that's what I figured, but I mean, I've spent hours researching this and just nothing said, oh, if it's uh, a mobile app or a software program or something like that, then it falls under this jurisdiction. And I had a heck of a lot of time. I still am de you know, okay. dealing with this. So. All right. Well, I, I hope that I've given you some assistance yeah. with, your, with your questions. I wish that some of this pro bono stuff had been available 10 years ago when I started down the road, which is why I did it myself. But I now, afford $300 on my own. But now you have specialized knowledge. You're here and you're sharing uh, with Cheryl. Yeah. You're sharing with Cheryl, <laughs> and she's able to take advantage of the knowledge that you're sharing in the room. Cheryl, are you an inventor? No. Are you, are you a, a, an artist? Yes. Okay. All right. So copyright-wise, that would be what you would be more interested in, in knowing about and, and That's learning about? Okay. okay. All right. Well, then we have plenty of information for you both. Um, I want to thank you both for coming. I want to thank everybody for sitting in here and listening to this, um, especially the attorneys who listen to me drone on. And, and for our hosts, I want to thank you for allowing me this opportunity to come out. Uh, I got to catch a flight. <laughs> and I've got to get out of here. But I wish you all the luck in the world. Let me give you, the Small Business Administration person um, had to leave. She left her cards. Card. Yeah. But she left cards, and let me make sure that I give you a copy of my card. John? Yes, sir. Besides you, were, were any of, and, and besides you, were any of you at the China Ivy Road I wasn't there yesterday, no. Oh, uh, uh, the two of you were? Mm -hmm. Okay, I thought one of you looked familiar. I was like, mm -hmm. I don't know, did you get it? Did you get it? Yeah! yeah. Man, you were dressed up, you got a shirt and tie on today! Oh, you did, a, you did a razzle dazzle on me! Yeah, I'm doing my best. <laughs> You're being successful. No, thanks. You're being successful. Did you get one of my business cards? I did not. I did not. And, and, and Thank I you, sir. did not. And yep. Okay. Yep. And you got my card, right? Yep. What? I got everybody else's card. I got everybody else's card. I'm sorry. Oh. Excuse me. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes my uh, presentation and my quick talk on, on uh, IP basics. And ladies, if you have questions or if there's something that you need, please call us at the USPTO office in uh, Detroit, okay, for some more information. There are... Um, Individuals who can provide you a little bit more support. We have some examiners who are, have been practicing, who have practiced on the outside, who have additional knowledge. They won't give you legal advice, but they can point you in the right direction. Does that make sense? They can suggest to you who you might want to talk to and what sources you might want to look at. Okay? 